I graduated OPRF in 2020. I wrote this poem when I was 16 or 17. <clears throat> the title of it is What Priscilla Was Like, and it's after Should Have Been Jimmy Savannah by Patricia Smith. My dad told me he wanted to name me after Priscilla, the black woman who mothered my granny. Books probably fit her fingers the same way regret sat comfortably on my father's tongue. She had artificial curls long as a pinky and a home in Tennessee, lived her life scared of white people with pink skin that threatened to make brown skin turn red skin. She begged my granny, who then was just Barbara, to be careful on Saturday nights, to pull down her dress so the boys down the street didn't get any ideas. Priscilla wore slippers made rough from too many cracked sidewalks and threadbare rugs. She was never afraid to bend the slippers into a weapon, one that had my granny looking past her last life, trying to wriggle out the best mistakes that warranted a slipper beating, the taste of concrete and frame cloth. Priscilla's voice boomed out intimidation, and it made up for fragile bones she passed on to granny and showed up in the new Priscilla, correctly named Micah, with a salted difference of time, and a mother too late to bring me Priscilla's death. Sometimes I imagine Priscilla is like me, determined but afraid, pessimism a feature in her mind. Her teeth would come in crooked and backward, branding self-conscious into her spine and trying every day not to slouch. She would be afraid of the steps she would take until death and wished heaven was like Neverland. She would be in love with a boy that would never love her back because he reminded her of a time she was happy. She would have no rhythm and would love dancing anyway, would talk in cursive lowercase sarcasm and be asked repeatedly to slow down, speak up, and be nice. I wonder if my father loved Priscilla for these reasons or if he loved her in spite of them. I hope he loves me more. I dream of Priscilla every night, and each time she's different, but always more beautiful. Okay, so to continue the theme of fathers, this is a different one. This poem is titled, I Think I Hate My Dad. <laughs> And I also hate how hate is always told it's a strong word. I want to tell my dad I hate him, and he knows it means only for today, only for this week, only for as long as he says hurtful things like he's reciting the alphabet. I want to say I hate my father, and he knows I mean I want his shoelaces to untie every 16 steps, or he burps in the middle of a conversation with his boss or the button of his favorite shirt pops off, and it's the one right in the middle. <laughs> and he tries to wear it anyway, but notices people's eyes gazing down and looking at his circular stomach poking out from the hole without a button. I want to say I hate my dad and for him to know that I'm still grateful that he makes me dinner every night and lets my boyfriend come over and stay for hours even though he hates company and puts my clothes in the dryer when I leave them in the washing machine. I want to tell my dad I hate him, so it stings enough that his mouth stays shut. Or maybe it nips at him just enough so he calls his sister and asks her how to fix things with me. I think telling him I hate him will be the only thing that will make him apologize sincerely. And if that doesn't change him, I might hate him in the way that sticks. I want to tell my dad I hate him the way I say I hate carrots, but I'll avoid them most of the time. But when they're placed in front of me with some ranch dressing, I might take a nibble. <laughs> I might take a bite, put a couple of them in my hand if they're the little ones, maybe keep them in my pocket to snack on later or share them with a friend. I might even ask my mom to put them on the grocery list. I hate how hate is said to be so serious. It's not so serious to me. I hate socks with holes in them but if only one out of the pair has a hole, I'll still wear them. I hate my hair on most days, but if someone were to shave it, I would hate that person more than any hair I ever had. And I hate my dad, 
but only for today. Although I hated him yesterday too. <laughs> and I might hate him tomorrow, but I hope it won't be longer than a week. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas Berry. Uh, I am, well, when I graduated, right? Okay. Uh, I graduated in 2019, um, and right now I am making money and figuring things out. So, yay. Um, this poem is one that I wrote when I was 18 years old, when I really thought I was making moves, but um, <laughs> not so much now. I've grown as a writer, which is nice. Um, so this poem is entitled, Mansion of the Figurative. I can make a simile out of a cracked mug handle. Say it's like an arm made of sloppy flesh. Call it my cousin's clattering car crash, where the car trips over the rubber of its own feet. Say it's a nappy head spared from road heat. The smoldered fumes that form with ignoring an octagon that calls for screeching pavement. Call the handle almost dead. Say it's like a relieved smile playing possum underneath my nose. A mug with a twisted arm is still able to identify as a mug. My cousin's forehead, integrating asphalt with its cracks, is still able to identify as a child's head, wanting to be touched by a mother's lips, made into something without throbbing. I can make a simile out of a typewriter, call it a tinkling justice, a muckraker's knife, Say it is ugly like the boy next door trope because the boy next door has been sliding like typewriters do, slipping out of a womb and finding his way to my body. Call it a monotone scream, a foster home for unknown paragraphs. Say it is like my best friend, always moving when I have something to say. Call it writer's climax, the tete-a-tete -tete between metal and paper fibers. Say it's forgotten or better still left behind. For all the similes I can make with the mundane, stretch my mouth into a peninsula, it will never excuse my pain. A poem will never replace a good night of weeping. Poems exist in order to notice the ache, give it a new abode laced in verbiage, a mansion made of the figurative. I wanted the right man to touch me, touch me wherever my muscles gurgled for air. I considered them a simile for a hammock twisting around me like a rope burn, a good flame. I wanted to suffocate in their arms, windpipe creased into a valley of sweat. But I only love men who are adept in leaving, ascended in abandonment of frail things. I can make a simile out of you, reading this, staring at these stanzas sideways with skepticism, call you an honest man, a screaming woman, a genuine other. Say you are like staring at flame through paper, revealing your true self with the flick of a candle. You can assume to know my afflictions, but for all the assumptions we can make about each other, we can never deny the ache of wanting to be touched, of wanting to be known without having to explain what's wrong. So, anyway, um, this next poem I also wrote when I was 18, but a more mature version of 18, I guess. Uh, and this title, uh, the title of this poem is Our Love Hypothesized. If there were a name for the heart descending into the stomach, it would be yours. Name dribbling blood that is mine, but not mine alone anymore. When giving blood, you must be clean skinned. Have a feast on your bedside table as a way to be prepared for fainting and swooning like twisted neck chickens feet severed at the ball. When giving blood, you give up scalp too. Massaging Jamaican black castor oil and coils on lamented nights, asking me about work today, if you will get lucky tonight or the morning after. In blood, there is a crime of caring, of me, wanting to be wanted in morning stench. It's crust. There is no blood in your body. Too proud to say I love you when coming home just for the weekend is a weak stream of blood, is no skin worth having around your neck. Okay. Hi, hey y'all. Hey. Um, 
Um, my name is Noel. I'm that kid's sister that just like blessed us with his brilliance. Uh, <laughs> um, I graduated in 2011, so I think I'm like the oldest contributor up here, like today, yeah? <laughs> Um, and now I, I own my own business and we'll be in business for six years, May 14th of this year. Maybe. Um, and because it's going so great, I get to be with Mr. Khan during the day at OPRF, uh, literally teaching this book, our baby, to freshmen and sophomores, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, yeah, you can clap it up for that. All right, I'm gonna read this poem I wrote. I think I was 24, 25, and I hadn't written a poem in like years, and so just bear with this baby of a poem. <laughs> um, and it's called, On the Bottom of a Swamp. What I remember most about fifth grade, besides the reds and pinks worn at recitals, the ones Miss McDaniels cooed over begging me to smile more or the boy I kissed tasting sweet for the first time before I could even prepare how green eyes made me erupt blush. I recall the study of the layers of rainforest, bottom to top. Emergent trees that stretched demanding to be hugged close, the canopy bright birds could hammock beneath, and the understory. I used to close my eyes on stage, tilt my head down, as if one could see their clear reflection in mud. And though my loving audience probably sang I love yous, I could never hear it. I'd always thought the understory to be like my smile. It hides forest floor, the way you hide grinding teeth. The sun never truly kisses its burst skin. I'm sure it tastes like the absence of sugar. And though dark, its brightly colored critters warn you here lies Swamp's Bottom. For all of the forest beauty, Mrs. McDaniels never warned me that rainforests in our minds match at every layer. Any misstep could lead lips to Swamp's Bottom. It tastes like throats back, where bitter things hit you hardest, shoot their best shots. She perhaps never saw that through my smile. I'd, ne I'd blush neon, warning a kid afraid of her own voice most likely because I had volcano sound and molehill body. Whatever case, I never dis expected depression to have a pretty colored warning sign. Wouldn't be till 14, I'd have the courage to stretch towards sunlight, or at least reach for a pen, a mic, be challenged to open my eyes, lift my head above canopy, find that sun smiles back, demanding to be kissed. All right, so this next poem I, I like a little bit better because um, I wrote it recently, um, and it is after Asia Kyle Kagner, who is another uh, contributor in the anthology, after her poem, Security Questions Ask Me the Right Questions to Know I Am Always Afraid. And this is called Why I Went at 12. Um, just so you guys know, in Chicago, we call 12 the cops, the police. So when I say 12, that's what I'm referring to. Cool? All right. <clears throat> Will you state your name for the record? Noel, as in Noel Alisa, as in she who lives, as in joy, as in favorite, as in love, as in dragon's fame, raw sugarcane, rim shot, Venus's breath, soul speller, heaping helping of slap the mama, cypher sweaty mic, last laugh, last lick back, Pimp smirk, crisp side of Franklin's face, Goldaston bow, thoracic wound healer, please don't misspell it. Can you describe your attacker? My ex's bloody knuckle I kissed and popped in place after a gauntlet. A jigsawed eye socket, and beyond that I can't remember. Did you catch his license plate number? I was too busy bambi gawking at his pistol when he took my, did you know, your attacker? 
about as well as you can know a bullet still nested in its chamber. How could you let this happen? I ask myself that at midnight often. I am just as stressed around 12 as I am around a random rubbernecking robber. I think in Chicago, right off the Ave, stolen bikes and jeep sneakers are crafty cotillions. The quince before, during, and after the quince, all of it is the meadow, all of it bloody knuckles and uncles screaming, you must never rush out into the meadow, even if it is your hood, even if mom lives just down the street, around the corner, Officer Coleman will flash his blue and never rush out. Just accuse me of not thinking a walk to my parents at this hour all the way through. I have run out of blood, ghost-stained, white-knuckled, fawn-kneed when I walk down the Ave, around the corner, at Costco, in Target, in the shower, to my car. Have I thought through enough yet? How y'all doing tonight? <laughs> so my name is Patrick Crisp. Um, I really don't know how to say exactly what I'm currently doing, so I'm gonna just say I'm a mobile in the making, just to make it real simple. <laughs> um, I graduated in 2014, so I'm only barely younger than Noel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and. This is my piece from the anthology, and it is called, I Could Have Been a Lot of Things. Um, yeah. I could have been a lot of things. Miss Walsh Farmer figured me best as wasted potential. Eighth grade was bitter like mama. The fruit picked from hours of labor too distant from perfection she thought her seed would bear early. I was bitter. Friends soared through graduation. My feathers embraced gravity too hard. Flight was for the creature that understood escape. I only knew my roots. I come from a bitter taste and heavy wings. Daddy was left. Daddy has left from the same door since he was my age. Mama's habits are older than me. They grew me as the first seed to slip past their tree's shadow. Act like there was no divot to slow my roll. What is up doesn't only come down. Here, it has to spill out, too. I was bitter. Mama didn't understand that. Mama tells me, if you don't get your stuff together, you'll be packing it, I tell her. I tell myself, she's bitter. Mama tells me, get your ass up for summer school. Mama hopes I grow in the summer. I'm bitter. Not ripe enough for high school. The halls smell too distant. I can feel the length of four years in the walk to the fourth floor. My kind of tree doesn't bloom here. Langston tells me to try. Puts a seed to my palm. Our trees are alike. Asia exhales apple pie. She asks me to make my own. It doesn't hum as sweet, but the flavor lost its glum. My words don't waft the shade of the tree. They glide away from bitter. Um, I also forgot to say when I wrote that piece. Um, I wrote that piece the same day PK said he needed pieces for the anthology. So whenever um, that day was, that's when that happened. <laughs> From there, I can't tell you much else. That's just, you know, whatever is whatever. Um, this piece, on the other hand, um, one second while I locate it. Um, here it goes, cool. One more second, wrong piece. <laughs> I indeed made this jacket, it's part of my mobilism. Just created a word, Look, Google it in like two years, you'll know who made it, you were all a witness. <laughs> Here we go. So I tried to give you the space to realize why or what really happened the other day. I want you to understand what caused this situation and hoped you'd call. 
but it dawned on me that first that's not happening. Then exactly why you wanted it to happen. You were the one who made the choice that I attempted to make months ago and got called out for not trying or giving up. Then in doing so, did no explanation of why. So let's be real for a second. And I'll tell you why I wanted to leave the first time and how this moment made me realize that nothing honestly changed between now and then. Simply put, I gave more than I have to give and it was breaking me down because the progress I was making still wasn't enough. I reworked my schedule, made adjustments to my entire daily routine, readjusted my finances, changed the way I engage with you emotionally, physically, all to please your needs and for you. I drank less. I was more open with my feelings as well as being able and willing to understand your points of view tried to come up with ways to creatively build a better relationship between us, all the while still trying to maintain the sanctity of who I am and whom I want to be. I don't feel like you attempted any of that for me. From something as simple as Christmas trees or waiting for the gender or when or where the baby goes to school or if she's going to have my name, your choice gets to be the final one. And in the case it isn't okay with me, you make me feel as if I'm crazy for going against what you feel is right. You make me feel like my opinion is either irrelevant or unneeded or way too much for this to work. Then to finish off your text the other day with, I don't need you, prove that to me. So if that be the case, I'd prefer we come to an agreement as to how we set up joint custody and get it taken care of before our daughter gets here. There's no need to make this ugly if you don't need me. It's no reason to make this a court battle if you don't need me. We can successfully create happy or healthy environments for our child together while still being apart. And FYI, I never cheated on you or regardless of whatever false narrative you come to believe, I honored you as mother and honored my child as yours and me as the father of that. And wouldn't do anything to harm my ability to be the best father or significant other possible. Every intention I ever had was always for prospering, whether it be baby showers or different events. I do want to thank you for showing me how much of a flawed man I am and how much I need to grow to be the person I can with and for you or my child. I just hope this doesn't become a situation in which you or I use her as a reason to make this any more difficult than it has to be. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pierre Saramaga. I'm a senior in high school. Um, I wrote this poem as a freshman, a 14-year-old freshman. And yeah, I am just looking for admission decisions from colleges. Um, I'm hoping to go to an Ivy League school. <laughs> the title of this piece is Transforming as My Mother. I sit with grandpa at his doctor's appointment. He holds my hand with his words. We wish for time to slow down. An impatient phone call leads us back to Rush Hospital. We grapple with our last bit of hope and trace our path across the city. There, I collect dust from stale air and beeping monitors that have become all too familiar. I walk into the room and lift my mother's swollen hand. This has the same effect as watching a clock. As time goes on, the pages left of her story grow thinner. So I sit with a chaplain, my prayers stacking into their own anthology. Because God said there's power in numbers, but I feel alone in fighting, and I'm ready to be released from an endless loop of hospital visits and imprisoning home life. On Sunday, I reach into my back pocket, pull out my last prayer to send. The prognosis rolls past. From there, it became clear words have always been my savior. I lawyered on her behalf, though time continues and her state remains unchanged. Each of her breaths violent and oscillated, but forgiving. 
and her cease ceaseless fighting proves that you can be the author of your own novel. Still, I touch the skin on my cheek and feel numb. Days of adrenaline run my restless nights and every thought of my childhood is a buried prologue. My mind ticks to only the painful memories because I've done just as much transforming as my mother. Today, my lungs take new breaths, enjoying the air and time she almost lost. This next piece, um, I wrote about a month ago. Um, it's actually a combination of two poems. It's called, huh? <laughs> yes. yeah, exclusive. Um, the title of it is Sunburn. Having known you for only Mercury's trip around the sun, I find my fingers intertwined with yours. What is this? Hurls from your lips and ricochets off the walls around my heart only to come back and make a noose out of my rose-colored artistries of you. The same ones that made me swear I'd never leave. Let me think it was okay to have to beg for freedom's breath and need permission to be the person I am and used to be. Tell me I'm the only one you pour gasoline over and you'll remember my glow as you ignite me. Remind me of the way it all started, interlocking arms and running towards euphoria. How the love rush twists my stomach muscles into butterflies, no matter how badly it burns. And if my retinas explode, you can remind me how beautiful the fireworks were and how you smiled cyanide sunbeams. As I let go, I pray I never forget my intuition again. Let me recognize the trouble coming to town and maybe this time it won't creep up like a silent disease. That love is a pain killer, but a partner could painlessly kill. That what tastes sweet could disguise itself as venom. And you, don't, and you won't know the damage is done until hugs that are a bit too long turn into tugs that are a bit too aggressive. When love silences fear and fear silences objections. I wonder, how would things have been different if she kept her guard up? If she knew a rose has a built-in self-defense, the thorn. Ben. Do you notice how I have to lower the mic? This is disrespectful. Okay, uh, before I do my intro, there is like mentions of uh, non-consensual context and uh, like essay in my poem, so if you need to step out, that's okay. I'm Van, um, I graduated in 2016? How old am I? Um, I graduated in 2016, and what I'm doing right now is working here. <laughs> um, oh, and I, I rap sometimes, I guess that counts. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm going to talk about the album after. Don't talk about it right now. Okay. Uh, this poem is called Mixed. When I dream about having a mixed kid, I have nightmares about her father raping me in a shed. White men are the most savage, built to take blood from the anemic. I'm afraid of my high yellow child because she will think I hate half of her. She would be 50% conqueror and 50% captured slave who is 50% claws and teeth. A middle finger to bigots, a victory for bigots. Blue Island made me dream about blonde hair and blue eyes, a white boy with politeness in his teeth. Even mutual attraction to white men feels predatory. The only one I ever talked to had eyes that were catfish fry too hard brown. And when he tells me I've dated black girls before, he was just trying to lure me into a lynch knot. For my proverbial daughter's father, I am a mantelpiece, a feast, a storehouse for his seed. My baby will be the sun in a jar of fog, murky chitlin water, the corners of crust on peach cobbler. Every time she likes a boy, I will recall the quaking of my thighs, the sneering of my ancestors. I hope she never asks how we fell in love. Her father will suggest she bring me in for show and tell a foolish ape with sperm constellating the fur of the lower jaw. Who am I to ask my child if her father is Columbus enough to turn her hunter? 
He taught her to aim a gun in my room, so I wonder if she'll be surprised when I'm not naked on the opposite end of the scope. When I dream about having mixed kids, I dream about murder too, about my baby's father building a kingdom of blood straight from my indentured arteries. Um, oh, right, I wrote that when I was like 19, 20. I was having a bad time. So <laughs> um, I did just have an album come out called Sonnets for Shorty. It's, uh, you can find it everywhere. Spotify, it's on YouTube too if you don't have streaming services, Apple Music, all that. Um, it's audio visual as in audio H visual, cause oh. So <laughs> um, I'm gonna do a rap from that. I was gonna do a rap that PK likes, but I can't remember the lyrics. <laughs> Period. Um, I'm gonna take my mask off, but I'm not gonna breathe on the mic. Like, I'm not gonna do that to y'all. <laughs> I wade through every day like it's quicksand. Stuck between wanting to drown and finding dry land. My grandma needled in my temples with a prayer hand. But honestly, I'll probably send for a few grand. My wallet hungry and my pockets filled with hunger pains. Tie me up and let my feet go to no throat remains. My fluidity holding hands with this lost feeling. And everyone I ever loved always leaves me kneeling. Today I remembered how your voice sounded when I watched you cook in the kitchen and my heart pounded. And when we went with my homies to see the fireworks, I wanted in between your thighs to the shower burst. But before I could do that, you was running from me. The last one to lie to me stays in Cali now. I thought we could make it, bought me shoes from the finish line. I didn't think you would smother me when you hear me down. Heard you talk to the kid, and that's all right with me. But you ain't earned the respect, I passed it to you. That's why it's radio silence from my side of the camp. You tried to break me, and I made sure we blew right through you. I won't talk like this song ain't about we were. At least my pen game can make blessings from this curse. When you play it for your new dude, you'll make it worse. Because somehow I messed up all the good you deserve. That's what you think, right? I know it is. You always find me asking for another trip. If love's a drug, I'm really happy for sobriety. Tired of you and all these other people trying me. Exhausted trying to fix you into who I'm still trying to be. Even if it hurts, letting you go is just fine with me. I was dealt with you in every facet. I'm sorry for how I hurt you. I was chasing action. Thought we could get it right, and then you lied to me. And I am cool enough to give it so you died to me. In that case, I guess the song's a eulogy. I can keep dirt on the casket and just let it be. I thought we could make it. Bought new shoes to the finish line. I didn't think you would smother me when you held me down. Exhausted trying to make you into who I'm still trying to be, then my arms are breaking, just let me go. <laughs> <laughs> that is me. <laughs> okay. I'm like mega vexed up, so don't even worry about it. I'm not gonna lie. I got like the shot, the second, the booster, whatever come after that, if it come after that. Trust, I wasn't playing around. So my name is Zaire, hi everybody. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Dang, that bad, huh? Okay, well I got a poem for you guys. It's called Spider Webs. I wrote this when I was about 18, 21 now. Um, and then what I'm up to currently, Wait, I got to back all the way back up. When I graduated, which was in 2019, like some of the other people up here. Um, and then what I'm up to now, I just, I'm a rapper. That's what I do. I like making clothes. I like doing a whole lot of things. And I mean a whole lot of things. Like yesterday, I decided I wanted to start cutting hair anything. Like I just, you know. So <laughs> uh, here's my poem. Spiderwebs. There's something about spiderwebs that makes us twins in a way. To us, they're an easy sweep of a broom to fix. In another existence, spiderwebs are vast, made of a steel adhesive, and impossible to escape from. I am a spiderweb in a main conversation at the picnic table full of web swatters. My aunties and older cousins all have their brooms lined up, ready to take a swing at me the second I'm spotted. You ever notice how spider webs just appear in the corner of your basement and are only problematic the second after you see them? <laughs> but if you never saw it, you go about your day and reach for the top shelf unbothered. You don't question it or the creature of its origin. You wouldn't question the existence of the web, it would just be. 
like me, in the OA reunion. I never wanted to cause anyone any trouble. So why are they trying to dish me into the dustpan on sight? This corner's threads were tailored to my liking until I ended up in the pile of younger kids the seniors saw as mere cobwebs. And I've seen people reach right past me a thousand times to the top shelf with no problem. Guess I'll find a better corner or people without brooms. Can we take this off? If not. Oh yeah. We can take it off. Ah, ah, ah. All right, so I'm going to <laughs> rap for you guys. I just made this like some days ago. Um, it's called Full Circle. I don't know when it's coming out. And so, yeah. My rap name is Desire. It's like, um, it's like my regular name, which is Zaire, but just with a D and an apostrophe in front of it. Um, and yeah, you can find me on Instagram at want the most. It's all together. So I'll say it again after I'm done rapping. But want the most spelled really regularly. No hard thinking. Um, all right. <laughs> Breaking my back just so I don't wonder what could have happened. Have a regret and unneeded stress as you could imagine. I always knew that I was somebody who full of magic, but I could have never told you that I'd be this good at rapping. I would have never said I was faced with a ton of danger of day ones becoming strangers and me owing people that know me good as my mother, a ton of favors of me with a bunch of ladies, of course, had a couple favorites. What's funny about it now is now you just somebody that I used to know. And I still be in places that we used to go. Two on a weekly and now I let no one see me Cause frankly I'm a bit damaged Be damned if I have to repeat Never slipping, I'm Aquaman when I'm in between sheets And everybody watching me now as if I'm the TV But you know what they say If it's worth it, it's never easy I'm working until I'm wheezing Hurting while pushing toward my purpose Instead of sleep, I've been a bit busy dreaming My energy tend to leave When the hands of life start to beat me My plans are a lot to manage Especially when I want to pan to another planet Is it destiny while I'm on this road My sanity vanished, whatever the case I'm not pretending to understand it They compliment it's underhanded. Fortunate for me, my confidence come from standing up on campus out in city streets, spitting the midden heat, leave people in disbelief. I mean, meeting chance when mom was slim as a skinny teen. Now I'm a 20 something of wearing the Billy jeans, ingesting poison and shortly after do silly things. That's what I think about when I sit sipping chamomile, coming to terms with the thoughts I have that I can't reveal. Meanwhile, peers of mine go out their way just to get a leg up, and somehow I surpassed everybody while standing still. Few flies, the man is still, but I know my kryptonite. So when Shorty send that text, I stay in the crib tonight. Cause I participated in, that just isn't right. <laughs> Double-edged sword, my wrongs that I get to write. And still people swear they wanna have my life. I'm staring at some, almost crashed my bike. If that don't tell you focus on yourself, King, I guarantee that you won't be happier when you're wealthy. Because I'm on the way, as of late, I've been a bit stealthy. And worked myself to death, what my friend said isn't healthy. Just got another job and went straight up said, what the hell is he? But I do what I do, cause I know nobody gonna help me. Peace. If you're impressed by the people behind me, please let them know it. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm very proud of them and very happy I've gotten to know them over the years. Um, if you are a family member of one of these talented people, can you please stand up? for being here and for bringing them to us. Um, if you are a current or former Spoken Word Club member, please stand up. You can stand. <laughs> and we've got at least three other people who are in the anthology in the audience. Um, so we got Christian Robinson back there. <laughs> We got Sierra Kidd in the corner. And Grace Fondal is there. We got Grace Fondal back there as well. So in spite of what Dawson and others said, the poems in this book are, are pretty impressive. And you, you heard them, am I right? Yeah. Right? 
So we definitely hope you, you get a copy. And what Noel and I have realized as we go into classes, we're trying to, to reach audiences that we, we don't have the reach to reach. If you know what I'm saying. So for instance, we sent 18 books to the Chicago Bulls and we're waiting to see what happens there. But we had a connection and the players and coaches are each supposed to be getting a copy. And I keep checking my email, hoping they say, oh yeah, and come in and do a reading for us or do a workshop for us. But if, if you happen to know people like Michael Jordan or Beyonce or whatever, please let us know because we want to get them a copy of the book. Um, so I think at this point, we're going to open it up to questions. Jabez, does that sound good? How do you want to do that? Just raise, raise your hand. And, all right, if you have a question for anyone here, for myself, about the anthology or about Spoken Word Club, um, please raise your hand. Don't be shy. Yes. Um, I have thought about it. The uh, question is, have we ever thought about having a reunion? Um, so this, this represents our 20th anniversary. We're in our 22nd or 23rd year. When I first went to London to live, I lived there for a couple years and we did a reunion of the original Spoken Word Club members. That was back in 2003. Um, but no, I mean, I'm hoping a lot of people come out for our final showcase, which will be April 26th. Um, and a lot of people come out for our event um, on April 7th at the Poetry Foundation, where Christian will be one of the readers and Grace will be one of the, one of the readers. Other questions? Sorry, I don't have a definitive answer to that. It's a great idea. If you want to host it, that would be even better. <laughs> great. All right, yes. Hey. Is that Marcellus Wyatt? It is. Oh my God. Wow, another original Spoken Word Club member. Um, so it was really two people that I taught. So Brandon Hurd and Dan Sullivan, who they've, they've given me permission to say this, right? Went from the lowest grade in my class. Uh, Sully went from the lowest grade in two American Lit classes to the highest grade because of poetry. And Brandon went from, you know, certainly to drop out, to, determined to drop out, to graduating high school because of poetry. So, <laughs> basically, I thought this is something, they need a space outside of the, the classroom just to share their voice and to empower them. So we started Spoken Word Club in 1999. We had, I don't know, Marcel, it's probably 35 people back then, right? And we used to take school, two school buses to the Chopin Theater, the Gill Complex, to do our showcases there. We had two showcases a year. We did um, a slam, a team slam in the little theater. Um, and then Sully and Rich Sobranski took over while I was in London, and then it just kept growing and growing, and, and now we've got this. So there's 76 poems in here. We could have had a thousand poems in here if the publisher would have allowed that, right? Um, so there are lots of people who are not in here who we hope we represent well. Thank you, Marcel. It's great to see you. It's been like 10 years probably. Yeah. Um, any other questions? And not just for me, we got all these talented people behind me. Yes, Catherine. Um, so I'm sorry, you haven't heard from the world yet, but I'm assuming. Is there, is there anyone out there um, looking for fan mail? Fan mail. <laughs> Noel? So my auntie texted me and was like, oh my God, y'all are in Target! <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was really cool. I mean, there we had a piece that was on CBS about a month or so ago, like a two-minute piece. Um, and some guys that I used to work with saw that and called me. They're like, you were on the news. Like, I could see your eyes through the mask. So um, that's been really cool to experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah, fan. Um, I haven't gotten fan mail, but it's mostly been a lot of, like, me minding my business and then my coworkers standing behind me and being like, we just got this book, why didn't you tell us you were in it? And then I'm like, because I don't want to talk about it. One of my coworkers emailed me and were like, you were on PBS. And I was like, why is my face anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe not fan mail, but more like, um, tell us when you're in things, fan. And I'm going to say no. 
Anyone else? I got some, after we were on PBS News Hour, I got some letters and people would stop in the hall and say, my grandpa called. <laughs> they saw you on TV. Uh, our superintendent said, my dad, who's 80 years old, my dad called, do you know this Peter Kahn guy? And he's like, yeah, he, he works for me, dad. Um, so the 65 and older crowd, we are quite famous. <laughs> Um, that wasn't necessarily the intent of the book. Oh, there's Kara's mom. Hey, Ms. Jackson. Um, so, yes, we're, we're famous in a weird kind of way. Any other questions? Yes. We were. Yeah, they, they um, followed several of us, uh, the Spoken Word Club members, and followed us around a little bit. Yes. That was an interesting experience. We're also in Louder Than a Bomb, the documentary. That was a blast to be a part of. So that came out in 2008, I believe. Yep. Yes, Van's mom. What are you about to ask? <laughs> 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 yeah. of my career, yes, April 26th. Oh, wow. <laughs> so let's see, we had our first showcase in 1999. Um, and for a long stretch, we had three a year. So we've had, you know, you do the math, quite a few showcases. So April 26th will be my last hurrah, and then I'll hand it over to somebody else. But it'll be, it looks like 10 group pieces. Haven't figured out much beyond that. There'll be some senior solos, um, and it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be at the high school. I imagine it'll sell out. Yes. Other questions? Thank you. I will miss you all. Anyone else? Yes. Who is your baby? Uh, she's not in the anthology, but if you'd like to hear her read a poem, we can have her come up. Come on. Hi, my name is Ezrina, Azzy for short, whichever. Um, I did see one in here that resonated with me a lot. Um, it's by um, Keja Janae Dawson. She was a class of 20, um, 2010, and it's called Get Pretty. Men look at me like a poster board, try to hold me just high enough to be seen, pin my hips to their sides. I must be something to look at but not to be careful with. And men don't care that you're made from paper. They leave small rips in every corner. We'll write all over you, autograph where it hurts most. My brother says, I just want everything I should be afraid of, that I sign myself up for what I know hurts. He says, I need to learn to give myself time to heal even when the scab is itching. I'm still not sure if I'm built like that. There's no in-between with me, no balance, just the ceiling and the earth, and neither have a limit. I learned all of my mother's lessons backward. My lips were cherry stained with accidentally falling for the wrong one. When a, from the south side, let's love stain his lips, you listen. You don't question it. It's usually never mentioned unless you become a casualty. And then everyone wants your portrait on a shirt. I didn't want to die from, for him to see me, so on accident, I held on to a boy who made me so unfamiliar, I didn't know myself. I've forgotten myself outside the hands of a man who beats me down without ever making a fist. I've been, I've been suffocating, sharing my air with a man-child who's still trying to break a woman who broke him before me. I'm still practicing patience for him, fighting my mirrors, so I get pretty. Mascara, contour, blush, install, weave. Is my pretty enough to be on his poster? If this is what it feels like to be beautiful, I don't want it. Take the dust from my face and free me. So 
I'd say maybe one more question and then maybe we can sign books before we head out. All right. <laughs> Any last question? Going once, going twice. What if y'all never see us again? <laughs> 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 Uh, well, thank you all so much for being here. Can you clap it up one more time for these poets? Thank you so much.